Hey YouTube, welcome back to the channel. And today I have a very exciting and educational video for you. So today I'm joined by Ryan Risk. Ryan is a poker pro and coach, uh, primarily playing 1K NL Plus online, as well as running a coaching for profit group, Poker with Risk. You guys have maybe seen him on YouTube and Twitch as well in the past. So today's video, I'm gonna have Ryan join me and review three pots that I play where I run some bluffs to let us know if the bluff was good, if it was bad, and how we should be thinking about through our theory differently. All right, everyone. So now I'm joined by Ryan Risk here from Poker with Risk. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. And could you tell us a little bit more about yourself as well as your coaching for profit group before we jump into these hands? Yeah, I've been playing poker for probably about eight years full time now, and uh, you know, met a group of guys along the way, and we all went from playing like 100 NL to playing 1K plus in about a year and a half. So we decided like maybe we could take what we've you know found success doing, try and help other people do it. Um, first success story we had, we took a guy who had basically just played in card rooms, was a friend of one of the coaches. And within a year of working with us, he was playing, you know, 500 now plus. So we thought, we thought, you know, we were just doing that kind of, you know, he was a friend, we were just helping him out. So we decided to just try it, you know, from a business standpoint. So since then we've taken, you know, several students from playing 50 now, 100 now to playing, you know, most students move up at least a stake and a half. We've had a lot of students move up, you know, 1K plus and stuff. So if you're interested in learning more of the program, just head over to uh, pokerwithrisk.com and you can you know, learn everything you need to know about the program there. All right. Sounds great. Thank you, Ryan. And now you guys can get a little bit of an inside look at what some one-on-one -on -one coaching looks like. So for today's video, we're going to be reviewing three bluffs that I run. Ryan will be letting me know if they're good bluffs, the bad bluffs, or how we should be looking at the hand differently. So let's jump into the hands. All right, so jumping on our first hand here, we're going to be reviewing three different bluffs. First one here is going to be with Ace-10 suited. So I'm going to be opening the button here, pretty standard open. We get three bet back over to me. Uh, for me, generally a pretty standard just call. Um, do you have any four betting here, Ryan, or is it mostly just flatting? No, you don't usually four bet as much of the uh, suited hands in position here, uh, just because they realize equity so well in position. So I'm going to typically use like some offsuit combos and then some like maybe some weaker suit combos, but yeah, not a hand like this too much. Okay, perfect. All right, so we get through about here. Do go for the call here. So we're one for one so far on this hand. Uh, so we get the queen jack 10 flop here. Our opponent goes for a half pot sizing. Uh, so when it gets to me here, my initial thoughts are our opponent's going to have a lot more of the nutted hands in range here. So I will have some ace king in range. I will have some queens in range, jacks in range, but again, not pure. I'll definitely be four betting those quite a bit. Uh, so my initial instinct, especially against half pot here, is I shouldn't have a ton of raises. Um, would you say that's, would you kind of agree with that, Ryan, or would you look at it differently? Yeah, like typically the bigger your opponent bets on textures where the strong portion of your range doesn't need much protection, you can basically just like not raise in position. So mm -hmm. on this spot, as you talked about, there's no, we don't have any nut advantage, right? The big, if he bets big in some scenario where we have more straights than he does or more sets or whatever, then obviously you could develop a raising range. But in spots like this, once your opponent's bet size gets bigger um, or the board's just like very locked down and very good for his range, you can basically just proceed by mainly call as the imposition player. Um, and like a lot of textures, you could just have no raises. So I think once he bets like this large, probably easiest for yourself to just you know continue by just calling and keep in you know you we do have some of those very strong hands but not too many of them are going to be incentivized from raising especially because your opponent can basically range bet this board even for this size um you know like he could bet a smaller size for definitely for range this size probably can still bet most of his range so whenever your opponent can basically range bet a spot you typically don't want to do much raising because the range can support a bet which means the range can support defending against a raise so that's not to say you never raise versus range bet, but on a texture that's this good for the small blind, you're probably going to want to mainly just call. All right, sounds good. So yeah, I basically I said kind of the same thoughts here for myself too. So especially with our specific hand too, I think pretty standard just call um, and just go ahead and take it to the turn. Now the jack and the turn is pretty interesting. So we do see our opponent check here, and I would think the jack in general, my initial thought is pretty good for my range. I'll definitely have a decent amount of jack X. We even talked about how I don't have a lot of raises. I would probably even consider just calling like Jack 10 on the flop. Uh, so we could have turned some boats. Um, now, as far as like trying to, our specific hand, I feel like mostly wants to check, but do you ever consider starting to turn the ace 10 to a bluff on a turn here? Or do you think we're strong enough where we just want to be checking back, especially if they're like range betting or close to it mm. um, themselves? I mean, this will always, this will always be a little like, so if you know your opponent's range betting, then this, like, we don't know that, but like hypothetically, say we assume he's betting basically his entire range draft bot, this board, this turn is not as good for us as it might appear because we don't have like that. It's not like we have an advantage of Jack X. 
Um, potentially he could even have an advantage of Jack X if say he's three bidding like King Jack off and you're folding that at a frequency or, you know, if you're not pure defending Ace Jack off, whatever it may be, um, he could actually have some more trips in range than we do. Um, but overall, I think in this spot, it's, it's not necessarily a good or bad card for either player. I think it kind of, uh, he'll have potentially more votes still though, and more Ace Kings. So he's still probably going to have more nuts in range. We just might catch up with a few hands like you know, ace, jack, jack, nine against some of his, you know, king, queen, kings, and aces type hands. Um, so typically this hand, you're probably not going to want to do a ton of betting. There's just like, there's not, if you bet this hand, you're supposed to bet, uh, you basically need to turn it into like a bluff because there's not much, in, sorry, as in you need to fire the river. But one thing to think about here is your opponent's checking range, and this will be relevant um, on the river as well. When your opponent has like strong but somewhat vulnerable hands in this spot, especially like nutted but vulnerable hands, he's going to mainly want to do a lot of betting with those. So his protection checks uh, are going to be like, you know, queens and queen jack. If he has like pocket tens uh, or ace king, those hands, you know, ace king will mix bet and check, but a hand like tens is going to want to bet a lot because it unblocks your jack x and unblocks your queen x and your queen x is going to want to check the turn. But if he bets pocket tens, he can get you to call, you know, all the hands that he beats that you might check. So the 10 is actually not that important versus his checking range. We don't block a ton of value with um, 10s because same thing, if he has jack 10 suited, he's mainly going to want to bet that too for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. He's going to want to protect his checking range with like the queen, pocket queens, queen jack region. So when we run a bluff here, the ace and the 10 don't do a ton for us, especially because the the hand that sticks out to me the most that wants to bet and not do a ton of checking would be ace jack. Because a hand like ace jack is like very strong, but somewhat vulnerable and it doesn't really uh it's not really that incentivized to check because you still have hands with equity against that hand that can you know check back and realize so ace jack's gonna bet whereas a hand like king jack is gonna want to check a bit more because that hand's not as nutted and it's also less vulnerable because it has you know the open ender to go with it mm -hmm. so you probably want to do some bluffing with some like maybe even a hand like king 10 I'm, i again i haven't looked at the specific combos here but i feel like a hand like ace 10 is mainly going to want to check and you're going to want to find bluffs so maybe like a hand like 10 9 which again has like a bit more incentive to to bluff because it unblocks his queen x unblocks his like ace x bluffs um and do a bit more checking with a hand like this yeah and i think that's a lot of good takeaways too kind of what you'd said i think for people to look at is like the most people think like oh my strongest hands i want to bluff or i want to make sure i'm betting but in this case when you have like you said the queen's full the queen jack like you're just not really worried about many rivers, right? Or any, <laughs> whereas like you said, like hands like ace king are still vulnerable to like a queen jack or 10 river. Um, and then same thing like with your, like your tens full technically you could hit like a queen that's bad, a jack that's bad, um, just things like that. So I think that's a good takeaway for both myself and everyone watching is just like you, your very, very best hands on some of these boards, especially where it's like before going to the river, you're not really worried about a lot of rivers. You can check those more often to kind of protect your checking range. But then those hands that are really strong, but still vulnerable, like an ace king here be more likely to bet. So mm -hmm. I think I think that's really good. You probably still mix in some checks with Ace King, just like you know for balance. But I would think yeah. like yeah, the the pocket tens and Jack ten are gonna be like almost full frequency bet. But so just important to know like this hand isn't like super relevant for like it's not like it doesn't have any great properties to run a bluff with basically. Yeah, and if we're betting, that's what we're doing, right? Okay. So. Yep. No. Yeah. Definitely agree. I'd definitely be a bluff at this point. So I end up checking back here. So we go to the river six of spades. Pretty big brick. Uh, so we face half pot here on the river, and then since we're watching a video of me running bluffs, I think you guys already know it's coming because I'm going to be jamming it in here. So I can already kind of tell based on our discussion here on the turn, this is maybe not going to be the hand we want to bluff. Um, I guess, would you say that's correct then? You would not want to use the ace 10 here? Yeah, like we just like don't really, you probably actually would rather use a queen here, to be honest. Like okay. if you're, because if we're bluffing, you know, if we're jamming this hand, uh, we have to figure out like what's the bottom of his value bet range. And we're trying to think of like how are we trying to make that portion of his range indifferent. Mm. Um, just from like a, you know, I'll quickly talk about like, I guess a theor theoretical approach approach and then like some exploitative caveats to that. Mm. But basically if you think of what we talked about on the turn, like a hand like ace jack, you know, if we're trying to get him to fold like a jack in this spot, that'd be like, you know, a strong hand that's kind of annoyed versus jam. Right. Yeah. Um, anything better than a jack is obviously calling. Um, and then obviously he's going to have some thin value bets that are in an annoying spot. But if we uh, if we think of what we've talked about this turn, most of his ace jack bets the turn, and he has a fair amount of ace jack. So ace jack suit, ace jack, jack uh, offsuit. So he's going to bet a lot of those on the turn. So again, the ace isn't super relevant because we're trying to when we shove this river, 
he's going to mainly just have to call if he has a jack, just based on how this spot works out. So we don't really block much jack X because those hands bet the turn. So we'd much rather run this bluff with a with a with a, sorry with a king. So a hand like king queen might actually be an okay hand to run a bluff with here, just like to shove the river. If you think again, like king queen doesn't beat any of his value bets, then I might as well, you know, it's it's either a bluff catcher or a uh, bluff. Mm-hmm. So you can sometimes call it to beat his bluffs, and you can also shove it to uh, you know make his hands like ace queen aces kings in an annoying spot, and then also like we talked about block hands like queen jack pocket queens and uh, his king jack. So like king queen has a lot of good properties to bluff here, whereas ace ten just doesn't really like. I know it's lower in range, um, but basically what you would probably want to do with this hand is just like bluff catch or fold. Now that is like again we have to assume our opponent has a perfectly balanced strategy. We also have mm-hmm. to know when we shove here what are we making our opponent indifferent with, right? Mm-hmm. So if we shove here, our opponent basically always calls a jack and just like, it's, you know, at this SPR, um, it just blocks too much value. And like, especially because in this position, if he has a jack, he always has a relevant side card. He doesn't have hands like, maybe at a low frequency, he can have a hand like jack eight suited, but basically he's going to have like jack nine suited, king jack suited, king jack off and ace jack. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those hands are going to have, you know, trips and some sort of relevant value blocker. They'll either block a straight or um, or a boat. So he's going to basically, yeah, like always call his jack X. And we're going to more make his like aces, kings, any of his thin value bets indifferent. So if you picture his calling range, so this is, you know, it's not always super important to like just be like this hand never jams in theory. So it's bad. Mm-hmm. If you can assume your opponent is doing something else with a different portion of his value region. So he maybe leaves this portion of his betting range kind of like uh unprotected mm-hmm. then he might fold a bit too much first the shove and then maybe we can get on board with shoving you know even a hand like this at a frequency mm-hmm. but it's good to at least like start with the theory and so basically if you kind of you know work your way through the hand how we talked about it you'll know on the river like what are my best cards to block the top of his range and as we talked about like aces i'm sorry ace will block like pocket aces which is not irrelevant but we mainly want to have, I think, either a king or even a nine would make a better bluff in this spot because mm-hmm. a hand like a nine would block his also his uh, his straights. He could have hands like king nine suited and ten nine suited. Uh, sorry, an eight nine suited. And mm-hmm. those hands are going to, you know, be in a pretty... They might also check the turn more because they're not as nutted on the turn, whereas ace king will bet more. So overall, I don't think the ace and the ten are the best candidates to use as a bluff here. But as I talked about, we can still... You know, sometimes mixing some of these combos, if we think our opponent isn't going to find the, you know, the hero call frequency enough. All right. So based on everything we've said, Ryan, I'm leaning towards, I think we're going to say no bluffing with this combo. Would you say that's correct? Yeah, that sounds about right. All right. So unfortunately, I did not listen to Ryan in my head at the moment. I do decide to go for the jam. Well, I guess I should say fortunately, because it gets it through this time. (laughs) Yeah, obviously, we don't want to be results oriented around here, but we do get it through. Uh, but I think a lot of good takeaways there, and I, especially because I think I was thinking of blocking the wrong cards, like, you know, as far as, like, which cards I want to have. So I think kind of going through that was really helpful. So 0 for 1 and so also, far um, on the bluffs. <laughs> yeah, well, it's also it's also good to always, you know, especially for someone like yourself, you play against a lot of these players on a regular basis. So everything we talked about is assuming your opponent is playing, like, perfectly balanced in this mm-hmm. spot. So it's always good to, like, you know, if you're paying attention, maybe you can pick up on some tendencies from your opponent, maybe this exact betting frequency or betting progression isn't super balanced and then your bluff becomes better or worse as a result of that right yep always a good point as well all right so that's the first one down we'll go ahead and jump into the second hand all right so second hand we're gonna look at here is defending king 10 in the big blinds uh so we're gonna see an open from a reg here in the hijack uh just a pretty standard defend for myself uh flop top uh, top pair here uh check small bet um, I would assume from an earlier position open, I don't want to have a lot of check raises with King 10 where it maybe could be considered against small size from button. So I would assume mm-hmm. mostly just want to call here. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I mean, again, another spot where whenever you're attacked, like we can assume he's betting very high frequency when he takes the small size on here mm-hmm. because he could go high frequency bigger bet here. Mm-hmm. Basically, like he could bet like 67% and bet pretty high frequency anyways. So if he's betting one third, I would assume like, you know, maybe not range bet, but close to range. Um, so against that, you'll see a bit of check raising from a hand like King 10 with a diamond, just because against that range, you just like push a lot of, you push a bit more equity, but you're still mainly in a call to King 10, um, quick, like side note, I know we're talking about the bluff mm-hmm. avenue here, but how would you be splitting up your check raises with say the top or let's say the top end of your range hands like King Jack, Jack five suited, that type of stuff. Yeah. So I think as far as like the value and bluffs, like the obvious check raises here I would have is like my King five suited defends my King Jack, 
Um, Jacks, uh, Kings I won't have in range. Jacks I probably have extremely low in range. Um, and then as far as my bluffs, uh, most revolving around like my high diamond flush draws. So probably like my ace and queen high flush draws. And then more of like the queen 10, I think would be kind of how I'd be dividing like my value and my bluffs here in this spot. Okay. Yeah, it's also good to mix in some, in this spot you can't have backdoor 5x, but like some of your like 5-4 di diamonds, like some of those, especially the low ones, because um, like you'd rather check raise a hand like 5-4 diamonds than ace-5 diamonds, just because if you turn an ace when you check raise ace-5 diamonds, it's not super beneficial. Like you can't keep playing for stacks in that scenario because your opponent improves too much on the ace. But if you check raise a hand like 5-4 suited, 5-3 suited, and you turn a 5 or a 3, then you still can like put in a lot of money against all of his ace king aces that type of his range right yeah so yeah some of the like low 5x work pretty well too yeah and that's a good point i hadn't thought of talking about like the 5-4 versus the ace 5 because like you said even though like ace 5 is technically a higher two pair realistically that connects with our opponent's range having more of like a an ace king and ace jack whereas if it's like a four or three it's not like they have those as often um yep. especially because they'd be able, they won't have the offsuit combos they just have more of the suited combos so yep. yeah that, that's a good takeaway for sure uh, so go ahead and just go for the call here. Two of spades on the turn. We check. Um, our opponent checks back here, so we're going to feel pretty good with the king 10 at this point. Um, I would have to imagine our opponent's shoes. I don't know how all the regs play these spots, but I know in, if I was in their spot, I'd be playing a lot of overbets or check here. Um, mm -hmm. So I would imagine that they can still have some decently strong hands here, but I would imagine king 10 the best hand most of the time going to the river. Would you say that's probably a fair assumption? Yeah, in this spot, he actually probably is King 10 becomes the hand he starts to mix a bit with. Mm -hmm. So, like, he's going to want to, especially on a turn like this, he's going to mainly want to overbet Ace King. Uh, basically, if he has like a top pair that beats all of your top pairs, that's going to be the like, first candidate that wants to just like pile money in. So, he's going to want to mainly overbet when he has Ace King and King Queen. Um, because you'll, you'll have a little bit of Ace King, King Queen, or, you'll have King Queen, obviously, but you're going to mainly three bet Ace King in these positions. So you'll uh, have so when he has ace king and king queen, he's mainly gonna want to overbet that. Uh king 10 will be the point where he has to, you know, he wants to give himself some top pairs on the river. So king 10 should be a hand that he mixes some checks on the turn as well. It can definitely make it into the overbet region, but I would think he wants to, you know, in NP versus big blind, he's gonna want to do a bit more checking with a hand like that. Gotcha. And then would you say though, like let's say this is like a button open, he has king 10, then it's more likely that he would overbet a king 10 just because the ranges change. Yeah, you're gonna have more um basically then you can have hands like king nine and king eight off like basically he always wants to you always want to think of your opponent's offsuit uh top pairs mm -hmm. you're also going to three bet more in those positions like you'll never have ace king yeah you'll even three bet some king queen so you're going to have less of the top pair hands um so then you know a hand like king 10 beats more of your value but it still becomes again we always want to like a hand like king 10 can't really go for three streets doesn't need a ton of protection so it makes a you know a decent check back in a lot of scenarios on the turn mm -hmm. um because if he's you know say he's over betting king 10 plus and when you get to the river with King 10 plus yourself, then you have like, you know, clear value and you never have to worry about being beat. You want to you know, at least make your opponent have to be um, somewhat aware of that, the fact that you can have some like strong uh, top pair hands on, in your check back range as well. Okay. Yep. Definitely something important. It's it's good takeaways too, because I know sometimes, like, especially when I'm on boards where I'm doing a lot of over betting, I'm always like trying to figure out the thresholds. So again, talking about how like, mainly looking for spots with single pair hands where it's like, we just have like top pairs that they don't have right like you said like ace king beats all the top pairs from the big line defend mostly or in the low frequency would be the same um so yeah. yeah i think a good takeaway here so we do see a check queen on the river here um so just kind of my general thoughts when i get to these spots on the river usually i'm splitting after it goes check check i'm out of position so I usually like a small size and a big size um usually in this spot here i'll be splitting between like third and pot whether or not those are the right sizes is a different discussion but i think like in this spot, I guess I think my main question would be is do I my initial instinct is this hand is good enough to use in my big size. So like I'd be potting the river for value. Um and then I guess also would you say is there merits for ever checking here? Or do you think we're just missing too much value versus like rivered queen x or maybe even some jack x too? I think when you're so this hand is probably not gonna want to do a ton of checking just because it's not strong enough to check raise. Mm -hmm. um and it's a bit like there's a lot of hands to get value from if we bet ourselves mm -hmm. so you'll you'll want to typically in these spots you're going to protect your checking range more with hands that can check raise so if you have ace 10 um if you have 10 9 like those type of hands might want to check raise if you have a set same idea um the one thing i would say is i think it's fine to just like two size approach this river but we need to be very so if this river had been like you know especially if it paired the board or was like say if it paired like the five or the deuce or the river was like a seven or anything completely brick. I think King 10 is probably like the bottom of what you can put in your pot range. Mm -hmm. I think on the queen, we have to be very like 
we have to be a lot more polar with our betting range when we go for the very large size because this river completes a lot of hands that your opponent's supposed to check back. So your opponent's supposed to check back some ace-10, check back some 10-9, um, and clearly check back, back hands like king-jack, pocket-queens. So there's actually a fair amount of um, hands for your opponent that improve on this river. And it's not some sort of river that gives us any advantage uh, in like hand strength. Like on this river, we haven't improved to any hand that our opponent can't have. So if that was, a, say there was like a straight that completed that only the big blind could have, then you could use a really big bet on the river because your range is going to ha you know have more of the nuts than your opponent will. Mm -hmm. But on this river, your opponent's range, even though he checked the turn, is going to have combos of the nuts that we won't have. Like he's going to have pocket queens, which we don't have. Um, and then we're going to have basically an equal share of the ace 10 and 10, nine. Maybe we have a few more combos of the 10, nine offsuit, but like overall, he's still going to have tons of very good hands on this river. Mm -hmm. So on these very like dynamic rivers that don't favor us in any way, you're going to need to be pretty polar with your big bet strategy. So I would think in this spot, the weakest hand that can big bet this river is going to be some sort of two pair. So if you had like queen deuce of diamonds, uh, especially, you know, having the queen is kind of nice here because you're going to block his improves because his improves on this river outside of ace 10 and 10, nine are like queen jack pocket queens type hands. Mm -hmm. So if we have a hand like queen five, queen deuce, we can pop the river uh, for our big bet and we can get value from his, you know, king X that checked the turn. Some of his hero calls that, you know, maybe he has a hand like ace queen, he hits the river and thinks he blocks some of your value. So he calls that type of hand. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like you pr probably want to pot some of your two pair, some of your straights. But also, again, you have to be careful because some of your straights are going to... If you have a straight, you kind of want to do all things, right? You want to sometimes yeah. bet small, sometimes bet, big bet, and then sometimes check raise. So it, it's, you know, the exact frequency isn't what, what's important. It's just to, good to know. Like, I want some of the, the the very strongest hands in all parts of my range on this river. Uh, your two pairs that aren't strong enough to check raise, but clearly, especially ones that unblock a king, are going to be pretty good candidates to use as your really big bet. And then some of your, uh, you know, hands that block his hero calls and also um but also can potentially sometimes bet three bet a hand like king queen or king jack go in the small size because again we're blocking a lot of his call region anyways so those hands can bet small and sometimes three bet versus raise so i think this hand uh probably a little bit of check and a little bit and then a lot of uh small bet would be your preferred size of the hand this i think it's just your uh i think the way you approach river was good but maybe you just aren't appreciating how good the queen is for even your opponent's check back range and how much that discounts a hand like king 10 on this river. Yeah, and I think that's a good takeaway to it. And I think what you talked about with like blocking the river and proves is important. So like the two pairs that include the queen being the most important. Because like you said, he'll have pocket queens, he'll have queen jack. Um, so if we have like queen five in our situation, like you said, um, even like queen two of diamonds, like it's kind of nice to block some of those like the biggest improves. Because like if he doesn't improve on the river, we're going to feel really good with two pair, right? outside of like is that exactly those two so i think that'd be good um so given everything ryan said unfortunately i do not listen to him we go for close to a pot size bet here um and this is where the hand gets interesting so i go for the pot size bet and get raised by my opponent so because this is a video of me running bluffs guys is that we're not just folding here so uh my initial thought in game here um so i do end up going for the all-in and my initial thoughts were that we do block the straights here that come in on the river so we block the ace 10 we block the 10 9 um, also a block that uh, maybe this is where I'm going to be curious to ask you is like, do we think blocking top set is super important here? My, I would think maybe a bit more no, just cause we'd imagine he bets the turn mostly with that, but I don't know if maybe he should be sneaking in some checkbacks blocking such a good, like, you know, top set. Whereas like, I know like a set of jacks would be betting more often cause it wouldn't block my King X continues as often. Um, mm. I was also hoping in this spot here is like, if he's raising like, queen like basically the value hands that i'm hoping that we can get him to fold here would be like a queen jack i'm hoping i can get queens to fold by the river uh, but maybe that's a little ambitious um because i think we'd have to be getting those folds so my general thoughts were like a having the tens really good as it blocks ace 10 10 9 and then also the king i'm not sure how important it is once it turns checks through but at least we do block like the top set if he's going to call with any sets um so i guess like what would be in your initial thoughts on that reasoning and then if we don't like using this hand as a bluff which ones do we use? I'd have to imagine like we don't have to have tons of bluffs in this box. because we're not going to have tons of value. Like you said, we'll have like the trap or not the trap, but we'll have the the ace 10, the 10, 9. But like you said, we're not going to have a peer here because I probably would check raise that at least some frequency on the river too instead of just betting out big. Yeah, so when I saw this hand, I kind of thought that part of the reason you might be using this combo is the fact that, you know, you block top set, which is relevant. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. if he's going to check the turn, top set makes a little, a little more sense than pocket jacks just because that hand... Mm -hmm unblocks king x wants to play for stacks um but this spot the thing that's interesting is 
it, depending on like uh, exactly your parameters and what solver you're using, I think one of the highest frequency bluffs for imposition is going to be pocket tens. Mm. So having a ten isn't like super great. Like it does block the straight and it block you know king ten blocks the straight blocks top set, but tens is going to be his like highest frequency bluff. So like having a ten kind of goes both ways. Mm-hmm. What ends up happening here in like some solvers I've looked at uh is it's kind of weird because so one thing to think about too is when we bet the big size he has to be somewhat selective with his value re- region so i don't think he's raising he'll raise pocket queens but i don't think he's going to raise like queen jack or even potentially hand like king queen that gets the river i think king queen can raise like out of frequency but he's gonna be relatively polar in this size because what he's basically doing with this size especially because we use the pot size i know in this scenario we have king 10 mm-hmm. um one thing one thing to think of too here is um if you have like the bottom of your value bet range and use a big size and you get raised it's probably like a pretty good spot to just like fold that hand if you don't think think you have amazing blockers you know mm. if you if you think it's a great bet three bet because it just has like perfect blockers sure but as i talked about in this spot like the tens kind of it goes both ways just because like obviously we want to block the straight um but we also do block uh, like i talked about a ton of his bluffs which are gonna be pocket tens mm-hmm. um but overall when you get to the spot when we pot we have to realize how polar his raising range is so I don't think he's going to raise like a hand like queen jack. So when we're, when we shove here, we're trying to, I think like basically the bottom of his value range is some sort of a, like a set. So he's going to have like pocket queens, maybe a bit of trapped pocket kings. And then uh, I guess you can give him a little bit of a hand like king queen, but I think that hand bests the turn so much in practice that he's just not really going to get to the river with king queen. Mm-hmm. So I think his value region is basically like a set or a straight. And so against that region, he's basically making all of our two pair kind of indifferent because he's allowed to have bluffs, right? His bluffs are going to yep. be, say, like pocket tens. Maybe he bluff raises against this size with a hand like ace, queen, or queen ten a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but pocket tens will be a very high frequency bluff for, for him. So he's already going to make, because he has like all combos of or pretty high frequency ace ten, pretty fi- high frequency pocket queens, and then hands like ten nine. Um, he can just like raise those raise some bluffs and it's going to make all of our two pair already indifferent in that spot. So I've seen in some solvers, what ends up happening here is your shoving range because of what his range looks like, because it's like, it's very difficult to bluff. You basically just shove ace 10 and he folds all of his uh, like indifferent hands, like pocket Queens and stuff. And he just calls when he has ace 10. So like you get him to uh, it's, it's a weird spot. Like solvers will output different things. But I think if you're going to choose combos to bluff with, this hand has some merit. I see what you're thinking. Like, again, block top set, I block a straight. Um, I would just think in practice, like, he is not going to raise you. With, it's very difficult for him to come up with, like, all the perfect frequency of bluffs compared to how much value he has. So I just don't know how effective this bluff is going to be in practice. So I'd be very wary of a spot like this where your opponent just improves to a lot, a lot of strong hands. We've also used a very large size representing a, a lot of the strength that we potentially have. Mm-hmm. And so if you're looking at a solver and it's like, ah, you don't really need to bluff here very much. You can kind of shove the nuts and like, you know, that's not typically how you want to approach poker. I'm going to shove the nuts and no yeah. bluffs. But there's little weird spots like this where your opponent's range becomes so polar. Because if you end up looking at this, when we shove, we're basically getting to fold like pocket tens and a set of queens. So it's like his range is so narrow on the river anyways, that it's very difficult for us to put a ton of bluffs into this range anyways. So you could, yeah, in this exact instance, um, I know I'm looking at like a spot like this in Ruse, there's been spots where you just shove value, but because ranges have got so polar and your opponent basically just calls when you have a chop and you can't yeah. fold everything else, right? So... Yeah, no, I think it's a good takeaway too, is like making sure that we're, you know, we want to assume that there's every spot, like our opponent here is going to have value in bluffs. But I think given what you said, both just like how they're supposed to play their range and just people in practice, like this can be very, very value heavy. And it's just like you said, it's it's hard to get lots of folds. I think a good point too, and that question I have is, if I were to say I've used a small size and they were to raise big, would you like the bluff jam a lot more just because they could be going for like a thinner value with say like a queen jack, whereas like against like a pot size here, they're probably just calling like you said? Yeah, I would see some, like in that line, it would make more sense because again, it, when you bet smaller, they're going to have thinner value raises and then yeah then our the spr is bigger and we can you know put them in a more annoying spot with their thin value raises and then having said everything we said i haven't looked at that node where we face small over we bet small and jam yeah um this hand would have more reasonable properties in that line because of everything we talked about we block top set and we block a straight mm-hmm. um so it would have some merit yeah definitely for that line but again you have to know when we shove there 
especially because like we're turning King 10 into a bluff. Clearly we're trying to get him to fold. You know, we could call if we think he's bluffing. So yeah. we're trying to get him to fold strong hands when we jam this hand. Mm-hmm. So basically you have to be like, I'm trying to get my opponent to fold. Like in this example, like we talked about his value, the bomb is value range is basically a set. So it's like, I'm trying to get my opponent to fold a set. Like, is that a very uh, like profitable bluff yeah. to try and run? I'm trying to get the bottom of my opponent's value range is a set. Um, or in the other example, it's basically like, do I think my opponent's value raising, you know, like queen jack, ace king that checked the turn effort, whatever like some thinner yeah. value because that's the region we're targeting right we don't want to put ourselves in a spot where it's like i think my opponent's going to fold everything that's not a straight and i block a straight mm-hmm. because you know if your opponent's if your opponent's only raising you with straights and sets probably not a spot you want to run any bluffs right like yeah that's poor range construction on his end and our counter would be to just like not bluff that node right mm-hmm. yep no that makes sense and i think that's some good takeaways there for sure as far as like just making sure you're doing a better job on my end of like, okay, here's how, like, if I was in my opponent's shoes, this is how we would respond or how we expect population to respond. Therefore, if their range is extremely value heavy, we don't need to have quite as many bluffs here on the river. So um, as I'd said, this is this hand is in the video because we're running bluffs. So I do decide to go for the jam and unfortunately it does not work out. Uh, rivered set of queens here. So try to run the so, big bluff does not work out for us. The, the thing to look, look again, I looked at this node, um, where our shoving range was only ace 10 and queens mm-hmm. is a fold mm-hmm. so we bluffed and he still called queens yeah kind of shows you exactly like this the spot we want to be like cautious of it's like if we know when we bluff here this is the type of hand that's supposed to fold mm-hmm. and this hand doesn't fold then you know he's making a calling mistake and our exploit should be to not bluff this node right yeah no and i think too and especially like when i saw the queens too i was like well i definitely like i said that made me instantly feel really bad about the bluff because i was like that was like maybe one of the hands i was trying to get to fold um but yeah so unfortunately this one just uh as soon as i saw that i was like uh not good and not what we wanted but (laughs) decided to run it there um and unfortunately it did not work out all right so jumping to our third and final hand here we've got an exciting one for you guys here with pocket tens so we get a limp cutoff open. We go for the three bet here at tens and back to the cutoff here who does decide to go for the call. Starts with 170 big blinds. So as of no, we are playing this hand a bit deeper. Uh, so we get the king seven three flop here, rainbow board. I'm doing a pretty high frequency small bet on these king high, ace high boards that don't have a flush draw or connected cards very often. Um, would you say overall, Ryan, that's probably okay to use a lot of small bets here? Yeah, especially versus like these positions where your opponent has a lot of like obviously we have a lot of hands that have missed, but overall mm-hmm. our range is gonna just gonna be very strong on this board. Mm-hmm. And your opponent has a very large chunk of very annoying hands to play against this size. Mm-hmm. You know, tons of hands that are like just backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw that he's gonna have to, you know, pick and choose based on like uh sorry, versus this size. So yeah, mm-hmm. I like the small size here. Okay. All right, so we go for a small size, get the call. Uh seven on the turn. So I'd have to imagine mostly doing a lot of checking on the seven. Now, to be fair, like if I'm three betting like a hand like a seven suited, because we talked about the fact that I'll be using a high frequency small bet, I can still have some seven X here, but my initial instinct is that the seven's probably better for our opponent's range than ours. Would you say that's fair? Uh, so yeah, a little, little bit, but again, not a spot where he's going to have a ton of seven X. Mm-hmm. First of all, like he isolated a recreational player. Uh, mm-hmm. so that's going to change things a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say he can't isolate hands like eight, seven suited, seven, six suited, mm-hmm. but overall it's not like the seven in these positions isn't super relevant because mm-hmm. he only has like suited combos and there's not that many. It's like seven, six suited, eight, seven suited, maybe a seven suited. So mm-hmm. it's not a super relevant portion of his range. Um, and if we have a hand, you know, it, it's, it becomes more relevant at this depth, obviously, because, mm-hmm. you know, like stacking off, we can't really get all in with like King Queen in this mm-hmm. scenario. Whereas if we're hundred big blinds deep, it's like uh King Queen's just gonna be good enough to get all in by mm-hmm. the river and a lot of runouts. Um, so for the deeper spot, we'll talk about in this scenario, mm-hmm. you're still in this spot going to want to mainly, if you have a seven here, you're going to want to mainly bet. Like you should have some hands like a seven, maybe eight, seven, seven, six. If you have a seven, you're going to do a lot of betting here yep. because your opponent has, you know, King X that's going to call down. Um, and if we have a seven, we want it. It's that type of hand that's like strong, unblocks his call downs, but is, you know, good enough to play for stacks. And if we threw out a hand like King seven suited, we would check that. If we have uh pocket Kings, we're going to want to check that, right? Mm-hmm. Like those will be the hands that we check to kind of protect our checking region um and then we can check obviously we're going to mix bet and check with some king x so even a hand like ace king can do some checking here mm. um if you have aces you're mainly going to want to bet for the same reasons especially mm. if you have like the perfect suits 
if you have ace of hearts, ace of diamonds, you block uh, two of the combos of ace seven suited. Mm -hmm. So it becomes even better because, you know, when he only has a few combos of seven X to begin with, blocking two combos actually becomes pretty relevant. So if you have, yeah, the aces, ace of hearts, ace of diamonds, you're going to want to like basically always bet that. But I think aces in general is just going to want to bet a lot here. Typically, when you have like the over pair that's just one notch higher than the top card in a three bet pot, that has can do a lot of betting on the turn. And in this instance, we only have aces, right? Nothing yeah. else is an overpair. So because of that, because you unblock top pairs and we'll say you're the most vulnerable of the overpairs, again, we're not super vulnerable with aces, but in yeah. this board, we have only one to choose from. So aces is going to do a lot of betting. So our checks will come from, like I talked about, if we have a hand like king seven suited, we'll check that. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a hand like pocket kings, you're going to want to check that. But you're going to do a lot of betting with aces, uh, you know, mix bet and check with a hand like ace king and king queen and do, you know, some more checking with King Jack and King 10. <clears throat> so this hand's going to want to just like check. It doesn't really have any properties that make it a good bet. Again, we kind of be turning our hand into a bluff mm -hmm. and it doesn't really have any, if anything, it's a bad hand to use because we don't block any seven X and by the river we want, like he can have a hand like King 10 and we don't want to block a hand like King 10 because that's going to be towards the bottom of his uh, you know river decision. Right. So mm -hmm. pretty bad hand to actually run any bluff with. Gotcha. And I think it's important too, we'll kind of see later in this hand talking about the aces. And I think this is maybe where I discounted because of stack depth, because I was thinking I would have a higher frequency checking or higher frequency check with aces. But I think for the reasons, like you said, even with how deep we are, it's just a hand that we can triple on most runouts. Um, especially like you said, if we're holding the red aces here, just because we block the two a seven suited combos. Um, so going to the turn here, I do decide to check as we talked about opponent checks back. Uh, River brings the ace of clubs. So interesting river card here i would have to imagine the ace a little bit better for my range than my opponents um do you think you would agree with that at this depth of, so at 100 big blinds it's still going to be say we'll mm -hmm. say better or neutral at this depth it's much better for you just because like sure you can't have aces much in this line as we talked about mm -hmm. but you can have aces you can have kings mm -hmm. um and you also could have some traps that, around the seven whereas if your opponent has a seven on the turn mm -hmm. he basically just wants to pure bet the turn because mm -hmm. it's that, like obviously you never want anything pure in theory mm -hmm. so he's going to want to do some checking with some strong hands um he's probably supposed to have some kings at this depth in position so he can maybe check a hand like pocket kings at a frequency um mm -hmm. and then maybe his hands like king seven suited or whatever and he can check those a little bit um but for the most part if he has a seven he's going to, want to do a lot of betting on the turn because mm -hmm. it's a hand that wants to play for stacks um and you've checked the turn so the top of his range on this river is probably a little bit of ace king but again i would think in practice people just like if they get checked to on this turn they just mainly bet ace king mm -hmm. so probably the top of his range is just like ace queen ace jack like that type of thing whereas we could still have ace king because like, as we talked about we want to do a bit of checking with ace king on the turn mm -hmm. we can have pocket kings like pure so mm -hmm. that's a very relevant combo on this river and we can have a little bit of aces so i think like we still have on this river we have way more combos of the nuts Mm -hmm. And we're very deep, so that's super relevant for our river decision. And like in position needs to be pretty aware of that because you know, as played, I know we check. Yeah. Um, in position needs to be very aware of that. That like the the SPR is still quite high on the river mm -hmm. um for the situation. So like thin value betting can get punished very aggressively by you because you still have a ton of the the nuts to jam on this river. So he needs to be very selective with the combos he bets on the river here. Okay. Perfect. All right. So like you said, we are going to check river here. I mean, I think tens just doesn't make a lot of sense to bet here. We can just try to hope check down, beat nines, eights. We beat a few things there. Um, and then if we bet, we just be bluffing. So we face the bet. And again, Ryan, this is a video of me running bluffs. So um, I feel like in this spot, kind of what we've talked about. So this is where I kind of struggle with this hand because I feel like all the points you made are a lot of kind of what I was thinking through is like his 7x is going to want to bet the turn, basically, if it's not pure, pretty close to it. Um, I'm going to have the Kings full in range. I'm going to have, I maybe discounted how often I'd be betting turn with aces. I think that's maybe like part of the mistake here. Uh, cause like when running the bluff, I'm thinking, okay, I can have aces full, I can have Kings full and I have quad sevens. Um, that's like the main range of what I'd be repping. And then also this just felt like another spot where I'm just like, my opponent just doesn't have a lot of strong hands. I'm sending it. <laughs> that's kind of how I felt in this one. <laughs> uh, cause again, kind of like we talked about, I would think, especially even like ace King here, I would think most of the time you'd want to bet turn. Um, in his spot, uh, when check two, and then, um, so I'm here with tens. I decide to send it in. Um, uh, so I guess like a couple questions here is like, first of all, 
do we think it's reasonable to kind of run it here because of the reason I'm talking about where it's just like, I feel like our, my opponent here just doesn't have a lot of strong hands, kind of some, like maybe best case scenario has ace king, but even then not at a high frequency. Um, maybe also a seven, six suited, but again, not a high frequency. It just feels like it's a spot where like, I just get a lot of folds. So that's the main thing. Um, so that's why I send it in here. But I think also another point is even if we think that it's a good board to run a bluff on is like, I wasn't sure what combos to use here because tens like I just randomly kind of I shouldn't say randomly but like I just jammed it in here again this is like I just don't think my opponent has a lot of calling hands so yeah. like if we're picking out which hands I would want to use as bluffs like what should like, what property should I be looking at uh would be like the next so, question this this spot's really interesting especially like we'll talk about it at 100 big blinds because mm -hmm. we're going to encounter that spot more often and then mm -hmm. you we can always extrapolate deeper mm -hmm. so at 100 big blinds well, you end, so when we check here, what would you assume the bottom of your opponent's value betting range is? Um, value betting, it's always interesting on these boards where it's like ace and seven with the king kicker because it's like they're chopping with like, even the ace queen is just like chopping with other ace x here because like I could still have some weaker ace x that like checks back. Um, so I would imagine like they should really just be betting any ace for value, especially if they don't think I'm going to be check raised bluffing a lot, just trying to target. Because I will have some king x that checks here. Like we talked about like king 10 suited, king jack suited. Um, so I would think those are the main ones they want to value bet. If anything, it's maybe a weird thing where it's like they more want to value bet. Like they're more likely to get called with like ace five because then they don't block my like king jack, king queen calls. Um, but I would think they can value bet any ace, but maybe that's too thin. Yeah, so it's, this spot's very interesting because it's it's very easy for us to punish our opponent in both lines. Mm -hmm. So when we get to this river, because of that fact that basically we always have the nuts and they never do, this will mm -hmm. be especially true at 100 big blinds because... Um, and 100 big blinds, they're going to basically pure four bet kings in these positions. Mm -hmm. They're going to pure four bet aces, um, obviously, and they're going to do potentially a bit more four betting with ace king. I think, especially because the board ran out in this exact fashion, they just also just don't have much ace king on the river. Because again, as we talked about, that hand's going to want to bet the turn quite a lot. Um, even if in theory it does a fair amount of checking, because again, you have to pick some invulnerable hands that can protect your checking range. I think in practice, people just bet ace king a ton on the turn. So the very, the interesting thing about this spot at 100 big blinds is we kind of just don't have to do a ton of bluffing in this node with this class of hand, because what we end up doing is we'll mix bet and check with all of our ace x because everything that's not ace king is chopping anyways, right? Ace queen is the same as ace deuce. They all don't matter. Um, Maybe Ace Deuce wants to bet a little bit more because we can we unblock some of his King X. But in general, if we have an Ace, we just want to mix, bet, and check with all of those. And when we check, so we're gonna have hands like Ace Jack that check, Ace uh, Queen that check, whatever. And our opponent bets. We use those as shoves because we make our opponent's Ace X indifferent. So he has to mix, call, and fold any value bet that he makes with an Ace now becomes indifferent because we're we're gonna check, shove all of our nutted hands. And then a bunch of our ace x that basically just you know because his value betting range is just an ace anyways mm -hmm. and because of the way the board ran out he doesn't really have it's not important to block a seven it's not important to block ace king because he doesn't have that it's not important to block pocket threes because he would always bet that on the turn so all we really mm -hmm. care about is that we have all the nuts and he doesn't and so we can bet for value with a portion of range and we can check shove um, our blocker is actually just top pair in this spot because mm -hmm. of this is a very specific run out if you change the king to any other card this effect will change, right? Because now yeah. um, your opponent can have a hand like Ace Queen or their kicker, no, their um, their floats will have kickers that play. But in this exact instance, it doesn't matter what your kicker is because you're playing, you know, the board. So basically, yeah, our only bluffs are just going to be our Ace X in this example. Mm -hmm. um, that's to say that's at 100 big blinds because when we check shove like Ace Eight on this river, you know, our opponent becomes indifferent with Ace Queen, Ace Jack, all these hands, right? Maybe they overfold, maybe they underfold, but at least like we can't really be punished, right? Like we go yeah. all in, he can't really call us with a better hand based on how the board ran out. And even if he can, it's such a small frequency that doesn't really matter. So it makes our opponent have to be very selective with their value bets when, when they check. Um, and if they're too selective with their value bets, because like if we check the river with any of our ASEX, it's not like we always have to shove them. We can also check call. So it's like he's going to bluff into a region that has a bunch of check shoves for value and merge. Mm -hmm. And then also has a bunch of check calls. So we're going to check shove or bet with a lot of those hands. Now, the only like, Caveat now we have is now we're 200 big blinds deep, right? Or 170 mm. to start the hand. Yeah. So now your opponent has to be even more selective with his betting because of what we talked about. Because now, um, you know, he was already indifferent at 100 big blinds when we check shove versus bet. Now we're deeper. So now all of those hands that are uncomfortable calls at 100 big blinds become significantly more uncomfortable. And so if he's value betting too many ASEX in this spot, for sure we can still take the same approach and shove our other ASEX. 
But now you get into that like exploitative territory where it's like, okay, my opponent hasn't protected his range much. Um, and I think that, you know, the top of his range is just like a, you know, ace queen with the king kicker. I can start shoving some bluffs like this hand. The mm -hmm. only thing I would say in this spot is if you're going to shove like random hands that are, say are outside of theory, mm -hmm. you probably want to block like a bit of his like best hands in that scenario. So maybe you want to use a hand like pocket sixes or pocket eights that like double block his like seven X that could have, you know, protection check the turn we'll say. Yeah. So maybe tens is just like that class of hand is still like a bit out of line. You would have to assume mm -hmm. that my opponent never bet calls the river with any like bare ace. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a lot of this is a lot of big blinds. So you know, there's a lot of people who might just yeah. overfold everything. Yeah. But I think at least to start with a theory, knowing like at 100 big blinds, our bluffs in this example, we'll call them bluffs, are mm -hmm. like you know ace ten, ace eight, whatever combos we have in that node. Um, you're actually probably going to prefer a lot of the the lower ones because your opponent's you want to like unblock his like potential bluffs, and he's probably going to bluff with like some middling pairs here. Not that it matters, right? But like yeah. it's just good to know. You always would prefer your opponent to have a bluff. Yep. So probably on this run out, he's supposed to maybe bluff with some of his lower pairs just because he wants to get you to fold like pocket queens, pocket jacks, pocket tens. Mm. So he's going to want to bluff with like pocket sixes or maybe pocket fives. So you prefer to jam with like kickers that don't block those hands. So, you know, maybe ace queen becomes a better jam or ace 10 or whatever it may be. Right. Mm. Uh, but this would be, yeah, this would be like, we think my opponent, you know, if we know our opponent never has the nuts and he's just here calling an ace, yeah. then like you could basically just go nuts here if you wanted to. Like, yeah. I, I understand why you did this, right? So, yeah. yeah, and that was kind of like I said, like, this is a spot where it's like, and it's a good takeaway of talking about like which hands we want to use. And I think a good point regarding the ace using that as our jam, both at 100 big blinds and 170, and like how that's different. But I think, like I said, this, this tens hand was definitely like, I have no idea if this is the one I'm supposed to use, but I'm just like, they just don't have enough. <laughs> like, I'm just like, I'm getting yeah. folds here really deep. Um, so would you say like, if we're going to start using, like, if we decide to just go crazy with the hands, like tens, I'm assuming it's a better bluff deeper like this, just because like we would probably expect to get more called more often. Say this hand starts hundred big blinds deep with the ace X. Would you say it's yeah. more, it makes more sense to be really out of line if it were deeper. Yeah. So like you're risking more in this scenario, obviously, but mm -hmm. your opponent isn't a much, especially again, if your opponent if ever you just like look at a sim on the river and you're like, my opponent has the discipline, has to have the discipline to not value bet every ace when I check. Yeah. And then when I shove, he also has the discipline to not fold every ace, right? So yeah. it's like your opponent has to play this node very carefully because both nodes can suck. If they value bet too thin and get jammed on, it sucks. Um, and if they don't value bet enough, then you overrealize. So it's a very yeah. difficult spot for imposition to play. Um, so I would think like start with the like go kind of crazy with your nutted hands and your just like bare ace X. Mm -hmm. And then if you notice like it's better to do this, you know, because you, you're free rolling if you jam here with like ace jack or whatever, yeah. right? Yep. You jam ace jack and your opponent folds. We don't learn much. But if we jam and your opponent like calls an ace, then we have some relevant information. Like he's willing to call for a chop at least in like a large jam spot. Yeah. Um. So you're never going to get a sample on anyone. This exact node is too unique, but it's mm -hmm. good to at least know like if your opponent is the type that likes to make hero calls, then you're going to want to stick to just jamming the free roll bluffs. We'll call them bluffs because, again, he's you know, yeah. he's indifferent with all of his bluff catchers. Um, and then save these hands for the guys who you know really don't like making those difficult calls, right? Mm -hmm. No, that's a good takeaway, too. I think, like, being very, like, really need, you really need to know your opponent in this spot, right? Like, are basically, are they folding that ace -X or are they calling the ace -X, I think is, like, the biggest takeaway here for sure. So we do go for the jam and get this one through, fortunately. So if I remember this hit, I mean, I do remember this hand correctly. I got tanked on for quite a while. It was pretty miserable, <laughs> but but we did see the fold eventually. So we got it through. It's always good. All right, guys. So that wraps up today's video. Huge thanks to Ryan for joining us. I think a lot of good takeaways reviewing these bluffs today. If you guys want to follow Ryan on a couple different social media platforms, I have his links to his Twitter, his Instagram, and his YouTube page. Also, if you guys are interested in getting more coaching with Ryan and the Poker with Risk group, I also have a link to that in the description below. And thanks again for joining us today, Ryan. Yeah, no worries. And you know, for you, yourself and any of the viewers, I think like some of the key takeaways were when we're running these big bluffs, uh, make sure that we're kind of thinking about what is the you know the bottom of my opponent's say bluff catching region that we want to really you know make indifferent, and how do we block the strongest portion of this range when we're running bluffs? So you know, for example, the first one, the Ace Ten. Uh, where we jam the river with ace 10 maybe ace 10 isn't exactly the right combos that we want and then the other one where you know you had talked about you know picking two sides on the river uh, appreciating how a board texture can really you know uh, make a large difference in what hands can we fit into our large size versus our small size so mm -hmm. just those like 
being really sharp on the river will make it really difficult for your opponent. And, you know, rivers are typically the biggest spot. So we want to make sure we're playing those ones as, to the best of our ability. So, yeah, hopefully those help. Yep. Perfect. All right. Thanks again, Ryan. And we'll see you guys again next video.